Thank you. Since this is a math lecture, let's go ahead and get straight to the point. Math problem number one, you will have 30 seconds to do this problem. Two boys on bicycles 20 miles apart began racing directly toward each other. The instant they started, a fly on the handlebar of one bicycle started flying straight toward the other cyclist. As soon as it reached the other handlebar, it turned and started back. The fly flew back and forth in this manner from handlebar to handlebar until the two bicycles met. If each bicycle had a constant speed of 10 miles an hour and the fly flew at a constant speed of 15 miles an hour, how far did the fly fly? You have 30 seconds and remember this is being televised throughout the world. <laughs> yes, okay, in reality you don't have um, 30 seconds but how many of you experienced this? By show of hands, how many of you experienced nervousness? Yes, um, rapid breathing, sweating, and some of you may have even gotten further and experienced some feelings of panic, right? Um, mental blocks in thinking and so on and so forth. We'll get back to that problem, but it brought me back to when I was a child growing up in a third world country, Trinidad, um, not Trinidad, Colorado, by the way. Um, <laughs> And as I was growing up, math was daunting for me. I remember the days where my aunt would sit at the table with me and it would just be painful. I would cry for hours and hours, but I had to learn math. I had to learn how to memorize things. I'm a child of a single mom, and I wanted you to be aware of dyscalculia, which afflicts 5% of the world's population. That's roughly 390, 391 million people worldwide. And that is a very real disorder, and um, several people uh, are afflicted by this. And what we're experiencing here is probably, let's see, more than 5% of the population, correct? And so we're looking beyond this. We're looking at what are the causes of this panic around mathematics, right? And so the uh, neuroscientists at Stanford University got together and they did an MRI study on a few math-phobic individuals and non-math-phobic individuals and found the following. When people were informed that a math, a, um, math cue or a math task was coming up, they actually experienced fear and it showed up on the MRI and some experienced pain. Math is painful. What's the story with that? Okay, so this was a visceral reaction. Not the math itself, but the mere thought that you're about to experience mathematics was daunting. So I asked the question, so to what extent is math anxiety influenced by poor teaching? Really, that's what we need to think about. And so in doing so, I had to go back to the creators of mathematics the men and women who were instrumental in moving the subject along. And you see it's a very diverse group, first of all, of uh, balding and non-balding men, um, with the exception of two women at the bottom. And I wanted to point out that it was very dangerous for women to do mathematics. So this is in line with the fear, I guess, and, and, and the pain associated with math. But um, Hypatia was a daughter of a mathematician who worked closely with Euclid and was teaching uh, at a museum when she was um, pulled out and subsequently murdered for her work in mathematics because women should never be involved with that higher order thinking. It was a very philosophical approach to mathematics. But in thinking of this and trying to answer that question, I also looked back and thought, you know, I need to really find out where we are today. Who are the greatest minds in mathematics? And so that brings me to the Fields Medal in Mathematics. And inscribed on the Fields Medal is to transcend one's spirit and to take hold or to master the world. The Fields Medal is offered to two, three, or four individuals every four years. And it is the highest prize in mathematics. There is no Nobel Prize in mathematics. There are all sorts of rumors about why that is, but uh, uh, Nobel, actually wrote in his will that he did not want it in mathematics. It's very fascinating. So I wanted to see who these folks are today. Who are the greatest minds? 
who we refer to as geniuses in mathematics. Here they are. You take a look at them, and you see it is a diverse group of balding and non-balding men, <laughs> once again. In fact, the Fields Medal has never been um, awarded to a woman. I wanted to also point out Gregory Perlman, the gentleman all the way to the right at the end. He solved one of the long-standing problems in mathematics. It's called the Poincaré conjecture. And with that, he was able to explain that the simplest shape that you can get in three dimensions is, in fact, a sphere. And there are implications for that because it says in his proof, he actually showed that he used something that's way more complex than I can ever think of or the mere mortal can. Um, and that is Ricci flows. And apparently the Ricci flows now indicate that there are eight geometries in the three-dimensional world that we live in. And so that was pretty significant. And every one of these individuals has done something significant in mathematics. So what is mathematics and why is it so daunting? There's pure mathematics, there's applied mathematics, um, and then those are the subjects that you usually experience. But really, if you look at how mathematics has been taught, it's been a behavioral approach where you lecture on a new math concept, a teacher then shows you an algorithm, and then you practice 20 to 100 problems daily. It sounds like a prescription, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and I have to thank uh, Basil Tarasco, who was a Ukrainian teacher in New York, and he changed my life uh, and my love for mathematics when I was in middle school. And so the metaphor I came up with Teaching mathematics with this approach is similar to a parent going to a child and saying, listen, I'm going to teach you one of the most incredible experiences you will ever have, hours and hours of fun for the rest of your life. Once you learn how to do it once, you will always know how to do it. And it's called bike riding. And here's a bicycle. But before we get to that, I'm going to teach you all of the details <laughs> of what a bicycle is about what the components are. I'll teach you what the chain is. And you know, by the time we're finished with everything, I know you want to get on that bike, but I, then I'm going to talk about the forces related to <laughs> bike riding and how it all works. Um, so quickly, children are going to say, I don't want to learn how to ride a bike. Bike riding is really hard. I, don't, you know, I have no idea of, of how to do that. And why would people want to do that? Here are the parts of the bicycle in mathematics. Worldwide, those are the topics that we expect kids in K through 12 to completely understand. And note that they don't really learn about errors until way down there. And usually that's about uh, high school and, and um, late middle school, um, uh, high school. So what I'm talking about then is a different approach to mathematics where you ask a, a question. Then you step back and you observe the trajectory of the learning that's taking place and then you ask another well-placed question that moves the student along in their thinking. Now, I know that is a challenge in the age of testing and accountability and all of these pieces, but fundamentally, that is what we need to get back to. Problem-based mathematical modeling. Imagine, for example, uh, students being able to access duplicating objects in the real world. Give them a challenge. Give kindergartners, elementary school students, Duplicate this particular object. Oh, and by the way, it's the space station. Can you uh, construct it and scale it down so that it fits in this room? Do you think we need to talk to them about ratio and proportion and all of those things? The answer is no. Um, and here's an example of something that's exciting. With the advent of 3D printers, folks are now actually creating these objects. And by the way, that's 50 microns. Um, and 50 microns, to give you some sense, a blood cell, the width of a blood cell, human blood cell, is about five microns. So this is pretty tiny. What if we taught area and volume by actually asking, what's, how much skin do you actually have on your body? Right? And can you model that um, so that your arms are cylinders or cones, and your trunk is a rectangular prism, and so on and so forth? There are really basic questions that kids can answer and explore without having to learn basic arithmetic and calculations. Not that it's not important. We need them to be further along. 
Teach them about the naturally occurring numbers, phi. That is 1.618. It's fascinating because you take an interval and things seem to follow the design of that interval. At the bottom you see that is a finger, an x-ray of a finger, and those increments are 1.67 larger than the previous increment. It's all over. It's everywhere. Teach them about pi, the fact that the length of that red arc divided by the length of that black diameter is actually pi, and it's always true. Teach them about the growth and decay and E. Teach them how to write ciphers. Do they need to know advanced mathematics in order to write secret codes? Kids love writing secret codes. Absolutely. And you, these are different ways that you can do that. Teach them that every image that they see, black and white image, and color for that matter, but this is a black and white example, can actually be broken down into a matrix of numbers, of zeros and ones. And then they can actually access signal processing because if you just took a corner like that 0, 1, 1, 0, you can actually average things out and start smoothing and doing edge detection and some really exciting things in mathematics. Or tell them, you know, are you tired of standing in line at the grocery store or being in line um, in traffic for hours and hours? We spend some ridiculous number of hours of our lives standing in line. Math talks about and investigates queuing theory at large scales, and we can get kids understanding some of those concepts. Here's an example of mathematics uh, concept called uh, recursion, where the results of a function are taken and placed right back into the same function, and these are actually generated by a computer using that math algorithm. It's called a fractal in this case, but they're used in movies regularly for backdrops and so on and so forth. Optimization, finding the maximum or the minimum of a function. Here are some emerging fields of science, fields that are brand new and will require us to have some mathematics beyond what kids get to. Entire textbooks are being rewritten as a result of the advent of technology. And so from us, we believe that we should revisit this problem, that 20 miles apart is important, the 10 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour. The answer here is that if they're 20 miles apart, it takes them one hour to meet in the center right? And so in one hour, how far has the fly flown? 15 miles. It's a simple problem, but working through all of the details and getting past that anxiety is the key. So I close with uh, one of my heroes, Richard Feynman, who says, to those who don't know mathematics, it is difficult to truly convey to you all the beauty in nature. And if you want to learn about nature, you must learn about mathematics. Thank you.